So Open City is about a young man who wanders around New York City um, 2006, a few years after 9-11, and it's a story of a year in his life. Um, but actually, what I want to read to you today is a sneak peek into my next project, what I will probably be working on for the next 10 years, probably. Um, it's a work of nonfiction, uh, but I think my central interest is writing about cities. And this is from a book about Lagos, Nigeria, which is the biggest city in Africa, and it's the fastest growing city in the world. It's one of the most complex and infuriating and interesting places on Earth. And I'm writing a nonfiction book of narrative about it that is primarily based on conversations with people who live in the city. Hmm. Bar Beach, on the southern edge of Victoria Island, is Nigeria's most famous beach. Its white sands extend for a few kilometers alongside Amadu Belo Way, and from there stretch eastward along the Lekki Peninsula, which contains some of the most coveted real estate in the city. I remember the beach in three distinct ways. In the first case, it was a place of weekend leisure for people of all classes, though my family did not visit it often, just once or twice a year. Secondly, it was a place of violence, and during the years of military rule, the preferred spot for public executions. Alleged armed robbers and drug offenders and accused coup plotters were tied to wooden poles and in the early hours of the morning, before a gathered crowd, shot. These shootings, called the Bar Beach Show, had a spiritual element to them. There were rumors that the condemned had amulets that could protect them from bullets, amulets that had protected them thus far. The men of the firing squads were careful to remove these objects before taking up their firing positions. The most notorious armed robber when I was in school, Lawrence the Law Anini, a serial killer of police officers, had been executed on Bar Beach in 1987. The executions were both grisly and cathartic, an enactment of Nigeria's ongoing national trauma in the years following the Civil War. The third element of my memory of the beach also had a spiritual aspect. The beach was a favored gathering place for the members of the Aladura churches, especially those affiliated with the Celestial Church of Christ. These people of prayer wore white robes and practiced a syncretic form of Christianity in which holy water played an important role. This milieu had been the setting of the two Brother Jero plays by Wole Shoyinka, in which he had satirized false prophets and their gullible followers. I visited the beach on a Sunday in November. It was my first time there in close to two decades. Riders went back and forth on the boardwalk, eyeing tourist quarry and nudging their horses all the way from the tarred lot to the water. Along Amadu Belo Way, self-appointed parking attendants harassed new arrivals for tips. The late afternoon sun glinted white off the waves and in the far distance, an armada of container ships, gray in the slant light, lined the horizon, awaiting processing at Apapa Port and Tin Can Island. The waves crashed heavily on the beach. It was a dangerous looking tide. I walked across the sand and saw on the last large dune before the water, a single red flag on a pole. Under the flag were two people, a man and a woman. They were at prayer and finished just before I reached them. The man, caught at the moment in which the long satin robe he was wearing was arrested at his torso, its unfilled limbs flapping in the wind and catching the sunlight, was like a pillar of fire. The woman's cotton dress was secured with a blue sash and her soft white cap set off her black face against the sky. Mr. Photographer, take our picture, she said. I smiled and I obliged with a few quick shots. So how do we get these ones? I asked her if she had an email address and she answered with incredulous laughter. 
and said she thought I had a portable printer with me. The man finally fit into his robe and took up his bag and prayer bell. Compared to her plain cotton, the satin of his robe struck an ostentatious note. I left them and continued on my way across the dune. A pair of riders approached me. Their horses moved closer and were all of a sudden too close for comfort. Why did they snap us? One of the riders said. What? You did snap us. Why you did snap us? He pointed the, to the camera slung around my neck. The horses circled and their impatient hooves kicked up the sand. The men, the one who was speaking and the one who remained silent, looked down at me. A danger had entered the afternoon. You no pay money and you did snap. I gestured to the horizon and explained that I had been taking photos of the ocean. Then, showing the requisite belligerence, I added that it was no fault of mine if their horses had entered into the picture frame. They regarded me with mute skepticism. They wanted money, and there was none to be had. We endured a time of silence, the horses pacing, their shadows falling on me. Then the riders, tired of the game, turned their horses around and rode away. I had been shooting them. The horses, the sea, the shapes and angles and fast moving light. But five minutes later, another man came up to me, another visitor to the beach, and this time, there was no question of money. Why were you taking my picture, he said. I saw you pointing your camera at us. I had seen him when I was crossing the dune. He'd been sitting with his girlfriend at some distance from the main crowds at the beach. I was exasperated at his angry tone. I hadn't taken any pictures of him, nor would it have crossed my mind to do so once I had noticed that he was on a date. I had barely noticed them and told him so. Give me your camera. I want to review the pictures. I might have acceded to the request since I had nothing to hide. All he would have seen was photographs of horses and sand and the Aladura couple. But I detested the feeling of being commanded. Something about his anger made me think that the woman with him was someone with whom he didn't wish to be publicly seen. <laughs> A mistress, perhaps. As we continued our dispute, an all-terrain vehicle roared past us, racing down the beach, keeping to the far line of the tide where the sand was most compacted. It had wide tires and an open frame. Show off, the man said. Yes, they're the ones spoiling the country, I added, eager to find common ground. The woman who had been sitting with him had come up to where we were. She wore a red tank top which rose at the waist to reveal the tiny scoop of her navel. She joined the jeers. Then, as we watched, the all-terrain vehicle stopped about 300 meters from us, right at the edge of the, of the shore. It was stuck. The driver revved it, but the compacted sand gave way and the, vi and the vehicle was mired deeper. By now, there was laughter all around the beach. Someone shouted, you see yourself? A big wave came in and inundated man and car. The man jumped out and grabbed the iron frame of the vehicle and tried to pull it away from the ocean's edge. It wouldn't budge. He struggled for a half minute or so, frantic, to the sound of mocking voices. A second wave rammed the shore, and in one of those surreal moments that the eye doubts, even as it witnesses it, the man and his car both rose and floated on the water. We could see that the man was still holding onto the car, still fighting to save it. Both were lofted out on the receding wave. Laughter ceased. The driver let go of the vehicle and the ocean swallowed it, neat, as one would an appetizing morsel. It became evident that the man couldn't swim. He flailed, fighting for his life, and only then, as the crowd gasped and as yet another big wave crested, did a swimmer in black trunks go in after him. The struggle was alarming but brief. In the end, in the space of a minute or so, the driver's limp but still living body was dragged out of the Atlantic and onto the shore. 
The vehicle had vanished without a trace, as though it had never been there. People gathered from all over the beach to gawk. The story was passed excitedly from those who had just seen it to those who had just missed it. A man hurrying past us on his way to the body said, just 10 minutes ago, a child was rescued on the other side of the beach, over there. He chased a ball into the water and the divers brought him out. It was only as I listened to this that I remembered that I had my camera with me and could have captured the near tragedy. Afternoon had deepened and dusk was already spreading like a stain across the eastern edges of the sky. The beach, buoyed by a story, took on a carnivalesque character. It had become a Fellini. An old man selling trinkets clambered purposefully across the dunes towards us. His manner was as though he had been sent with a message, as though he were indeed a chorus member in this callous entertainment of the gods. When he reached us, he cleared his throat and began a recitation in pidgin English. Ocean no de hear English. Ocean no de hear Yoruba language. Ocean no de hear Igbo. Ocean no de hear Edo. Ocean no de hear Indian Seth. His eyes were roomy and there was a laconic irony in his manner. The thing way ocean they hear, he said, gesturing to the man lying on the shore. The thing way ocean they hear, him no fit talk. And I couldn't have imagined, as I watched the near dead man lying there, that a year later I would be sitting in his Ikeja office, talking to him and laughing at his jokes. Thank you.